rest upon us this morning. We're preparing our hearts for you, Lord. We want more of you in this place, more of you in our spirit. We ask you to fill us up this morning, Lord. Spirit, we make room in our hearts this morning because we want you to rest on us, Lord. We make room for you right here, right now. We just open up our hearts to you, Lord. We open our hearts. Yes, Jesus. Holy Spirit. Here is where I lay it down. Every burden, every crown. This is my surrender. This is my surrender. Here is where I lay it down. Every lie and every doubt. This is my surrender. And I will make room for you.
Heaven is your throne and earth is your footstool. And you're asking us, where will my resting place be? Lord, we are your temple. We are your resting place. And this morning, Lord, we make room for, we make room for you. We surrender of our will. We surrender of our ways and our thoughts our mindsets, our traditions, our, our religions, all these things that we have set up as, as, as the way, but you, Lord, are the way. Shake us up, Lord, as only you can. Stir up our spirits for you. Refine us with your refining fire so that all that is left it's all of you inside of us, Lord. 
we ask for you to make your home in us. Make your home in us, Lord. We praise you, Lord. Yes, Lord. That will make room for you to do whatever you want to. To do whatever you want to. Thank you for this time this morning that we can worship you and praise you with all that was within us. We thank you for your spirit that is in this place, that it washes over us. And we thank you, Lord, for the word that's going to be spoken to us this morning that will mold us and will shape us into your likeness. We praise you. We praise you and we love you. Amen. Amen. Kids are dismissed for Children's Church, and now we will have the announcements. Welcome, church family. Thank you for joining us at Monterey Bay Christian Center. Here are the announcements for this week. Good morning. If you're new with us in person in or online, we want you to know how excited we are Amen. to have you. Amen. And we'd like to get to know you. <laughs> Text the word yes. We're going to mix it up a little bit today, but instead of uh, cutting off after the worship and going to announcements, we're going to go straight into the word. Okay. I don't have a, the notes aren't going to be up on the screen. I didn't get to it early enough in the week. I apologize for that. Uh, the pastor got a hold of me, I believe it was either Monday or Tuesday night, to come and speak today on the armor of God. So we're going to be going uh, off of Ephesians uh, chapter 6, verses 10 through 8. Okay. Well, first off, uh, I just want to piggyback on some of the things that pastor's been preaching in the, the last couple of weeks. Uh, I was reading Oswald Chambers this morning, and he was talking about fasting. And he said fasting, you know, 100 years ago used to be for food, uh, 200 years ago food, because it was not readily available. You had to work all summer long, and then if you didn't uh, harvest properly, uh, guess what? You starved in the winter. Well, Oswald Chambers wants to take us to a higher level of, of fasting against whatever is inhibiting you from getting closer to the gospel. Uh, it could be your cell phone. Uh, what's the first thing you do in the morning when you get up? Uh, in uh, Judaism, the first thing you're supposed to do when your feet hit the ground is thank God for him watching over you through the night and giving you another day. Is the first thing you do when you get up, check your cell phone? Uh, maybe it's too much uh, TV. Maybe it's a boyfriend. Maybe it's a girlfriend that's inhibiting you from getting closer to God. These are things also that we can fast of to get us closer to God, okay? Um, I want to thank Pastor for this opportunity because it is an honor to speak for God. It's really a privilege. And, you know, I want to thank my wife, and I was thinking about Pastor's wife too because behind every man, there's a good woman, okay? And, and they are there supporting us uh, through the good times, through the bad times, day and night, and so I just want to thank them for what they do, okay? Um, let's go ahead and pray. Holy Spirit, uh, it is a time of tribulation and darkness in your creation. Holy Spirit, we are here to be disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. May your word enter our hearts today that we may be doers as well as hearers. Guide us in this spiritual battle that we are in until you, Jesus, come again or we go home to you. And we thank you for that, Heavenly Father. In your holy name, amen. I'm going to be using King James. I'm old-fashioned. Um, first verse I always like to start off anytime I preach with is Genesis 1-1. 
in the beginning God God is there if God is there, then it behooves me, if I have uh, intelligence, to figure out what God created me for and what I need to do to be in fellowship with him. God did not create you to ignore you, okay? He created each and every one of us here with a purpose. It's called finding out what the will of God is in your life, okay? Uh, this message is mainly for the believers. Uh, if you're a non-believer, come see me after service. We'll talk about what you need to do to get salvation. Uh, it's not going to do you any good if you don't believe in Jesus Christ to try and put on the armor of God. The Word of God is a spiritual book. It can only be interpreted through the Holy Spirit. That's why so many times when you see intellectuals speaking about the Word of God, us novices without any college degrees can see them stumble in the Word because without the Holy Spirit, the Word is just another book to you. Okay? Um, you do need to accept Jesus because when God created the heavens and the earth, a little problem occurred, and that was called man. Man sinned. The good news is that Jesus came down here, sent from God to give us salvation so that we can get back into that right uh, relationship with God. Okay? That's what it's all about being in a relationship with God. Okay? <clears throat> Our life is warfare, okay? Do we as humans not struggle every day in human life? Uh, one of the recent phenomena that you and I deal with every day is traffic on the highway. Uh, you know, 100 years ago, people weren't cutting you off on the highway. Uh, people weren't uh, crashing into each other. Uh, you, you, you weren't dealing with uh, COVID. Uh, I don't know if anybody's heard about the latest one, monkey pox is coming across America right now. Uh, you're dealing right now with inflation, okay? Uh, your wages are decreasing. You, every day, uh, uh, as, a, as a human, you have a adversity, okay? Um, but not only do believers have a struggle in everyday life, but we also, as a believer, have spiritual conflict, okay? So we have an adversary. His name is Satan. Satan in Greek means adversary. Uh, Jesus uh, stops that adversary from being able to do anything to you once you accept Jesus as your Savior. Everything the devil does to a believer is to turn your faith away from God, to get you to doubt in his word, okay? Um, in 1 Peter 5.8, it says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, which means your enemy, walks about seeking whom he may devour. Uh, and so when I was looking up uh, at this in the Greek, the devil wants to devour you. He wants to swallow you up. The Greek word is katapino. He wants to gulp you down. He wants to submerge you, annihilate you, engulf you, and overwhelm you. So you have this adversary out there that right now, as we sit in this church, uh, is trying to just decimate you, okay? And the only way you're going to withstand this decimation is through accepting Jesus Christ as your Savior, accepting His Holy Spirit, and then doing as the Apostle Paul said, putting on the armor of God, okay? Uh, it's interesting, um, hundreds of years ago, not only the knights, but the samurai uh, used to wear armor. They used to wear this armor to protect themselves so they could do battle, okay? Now, with modern man, it's interesting too, also. Uh, I'm gonna age myself here. We didn't have body armor when I was in the military, uh, but they have body armor now. Same thing now. They put armor on people in order to protect them so that they can go out and do battle. Now, imagine that in this room right now, there are spiritual beings, good ones and bad ones. Okay, the angels, everybody here has a guardian angel. There's an angel right now sitting next to you. You can't see him. There are demons in this room right now, too, that are trying to get your mind off the Word of God right now. Maybe thinking of a boyfriend, maybe thinking, of, uh, I know during football season, most of us are going, hey, I wonder what the score of the game is. Okay, it might be right now, that guy's boring up there. Uh, I want to go to lunch, okay? These are all little attacks that, that uh, are happening. As Rabbi Schneider says, the battle for us as Christians is in the mind. Okay? I'm not going to go out and cheat on my wife. I'm not going to go out and do drugs. Uh, so everybody knows I'm a recovered drug addict. Um, these are not, I'm not going to really be struggling with that type of a flesh thing. 
I am going to struggle with anger. I am going to struggle with pride. I'm going to struggle with these other type of uh, spiritual battles that are mainly in our mind, okay? We Christians need the armor, and whose armor? We need the armor of God. In the epistle of Ephesians, remember as we look at the New Testament that most of the New Testament, other than the Gospels and the book of Acts, are letters. These are letters that the Apostle Paul was writing to the churches. He is speaking to Christians in every one of these letters. He is not speaking to the non-believers, okay? And so the Apostle Paul points out that spiritual warfare is taking place in our life as believers, okay? So each and every one of you here, uh, I, we had a meeting a couple weeks ago about the prayer team, and I don't know how many people in here have, have ever had a demonic experiences, but when you start pushing forth the kingdom of God, expect that the devil's going to push back, okay? You're going to be in a battle, okay? The devil is trying to get your soul just like God is trying to get your soul. So we're going to start off in, uh, in uh, Ephesians 6. And three times we are told to stand. Three times in this set of verses, uh, 10 through, uh, we're going to add 18 in today. It tells you to stand. It doesn't tell you to flee from the devil. What does it tell you to do? Resist him and stand, okay? It's interesting that God's armor only equips the front. Nothing that God gives to protect you protects the back. The breastplate, the helmet. The shield, the girt your loins with truth. It's because you are commanded to, to, to stand. You are not to turn away from the devil. You are to resist him and he will flee from you. Okay? And we know this because in 2 Corinthians 10 uh, 4, it says, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, fleshly, but might through God who pulls down strongholds. Okay? And so, and then in Romans 13, 12, Paul tells us to put on the armor of light. Put on the armor of God. It is a verb. Too many people think that being a Christian is a noun. It is not a noun. It is a verb. Uh, at the end of this message, I will be talking a little bit about the new ministry that we're coming up here at the church, where we want to be doers of the word, not just hearers. It doesn't do me any good when I see that my brother doesn't have a coat. I pray for him and tell him to go his way. I need to do something to provide for that need, okay? So the first verse we're going to go over today is Ephesians 6, 10, and it says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Okay, so who is it telling us to be strong in there? The Lord. And what are we to be strong in? The power of his might. What do we know that Jesus has already done? He's overcome death. The greatest fear of every human being is death. People uh, are scared to death of uh, getting a, a disease and dying. You don't have to fear death as a Christian, okay? Because you are an eternal being. You are either going to be in eternity with God or you're going to be in eternity without God. You make that choice the minute you decide what you do when you hear the name of Jesus. He tells us to be strong in the power of his might, okay? How? How, how, are, we, how are we strong in the power of might? And it says in Proverbs 3, 5, We trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not unto your own understanding. Too many Christians nowadays go home, and what's the first thing they do? Turn on the TV and listen to the news. It says in Psalms 1, first verse, Blessed is the man who listens not to the counsel of the ungodly. Everybody who is not a believer will Deuteronomy, uh, Israel, God is our God. Uh, he's the one and only God, and we are to love him with all our heart, mind, and soul. Okay? So make sure that you're not leaning to your own understanding. Remember that what I know is...
get into the word pray okay that's how I acquire strength uh, I'm not going to acquire strength any other ways okay start fasting start meditating on God's word uh, one of the things that changed my life uh, I was raised in the church I was a rebellious uh, transgressor I committed iniquities uh, I totally rebelled against God and uh, one day my brother gave me a book by Rick Warren and it was called The Purpose Driven Life and I said nah I don't need this thing but I just happened to read it and it, in that book it spoke of how most Christians didn't even know where the Ten Commandments are in the Bible pow it was like getting hit over the head with a two by four here I was in rebellion here in the past I'd accept Jesus as my Savior and I'd walked away from him and here he was pointing out a, a, a simple thing, that if I claimed to be uh, a Christian, I would have to need to know what God's word is. Uh, and how do I know what God's word is except for I read it, I meditate on it. When I started meditating on it, uh, we used to do a program here called Cleansing Stream, and uh, Pastor Jason was here. We've had two Pastor Jasons, I guess that tells you how old I am. Uh, we had Pastor Jason here, and we used to always listen to Jack Hayford, and he would talk about how uh, I get up in the morning and I pray for so long, and I was like, man, I can only last five minutes before my mind is off on another thing, okay? But as you make this a, uh, uh, as you seek the Lord, he's going to reveal himself to you. Now the Holy Spirit will make that time from five minutes into ten minutes. He will make that time from 30 minutes to an hour. He will make it so that the only thing you savor in the day is the Word of God. Okay? We think of Jesus. What did Jesus do in the morning? He got up early and prayed. What did Jesus do in the evening? He prayed. Daniel, one of the most righteous men in the Bible. There's only a couple of them whose righteousness was good enough for them to uh, basically be taken right up into heaven. Daniel prayed three times a day, morning, noon, and night. So in order for me to be strong in the word and strong in the power and the might of the God, I have to seek him. It doesn't mean just coming to church on Sunday. It doesn't mean that I just pray when I eat my food. It means I pray all the time. Pray, be, praying and seeking God becomes the focus of my life. Okay? Now let's go on to verse 11. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand. There's that word again. Against the wiles of the devil. That's a verb, put, indio. It means be clothed with the spiritual gifts, graces, and character of God. Okay? This is a promise from God. If you want to know what you're entitled to in the Bible from God, you have to read it. That you will be able to. It says right here that when you put on the armor, I'll be able to stand against the devil. If I don't put the armor on, I'm not going to be able to stand against the devil. As a young Christian, in my time of rebellion, I thought I could stand against the devil by myself. And he proved me wrong. He totally proved me wrong. I can only stand when I stand on the word of God. Other than that, there is no other truth. 1 Thessalonians 5.8 but let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. James 4, 7, submit yourselves to God. Resist and stand against the devil, and he will flee from you. Okay, so when you're having problems, recognize that, yes, my boss is a butthead, and I'm upset at the way he treats me sometimes. Um, but the devil might be working behind him, okay? There might be a spiritual uh, uh, principality or power that is using that person to upset you, okay? Then once we get upset, we take our mind off God. It's not fair. Why do I have to do this? Now all of a sudden, I'm not standing in the power of God anymore. I'm letting my sinful self-esteem take over. Uh, remember in the Bible that uh, it says that we are just like the grasshoppers before God. We're like worms before God. Now, I don't mean that in a negative thing. God loves you, okay? Otherwise, he would not send his son to you. And what will happen when you put on this? The devil will free, okay? And so put on and stand, okay? You've been given the authority and the power of the Lord God of Israel. Use it. If you just take that, uh, if you just take it and put it 
aside that Bible and just, you know, if you, it's interesting. I have Bibles, and some of them are my dad's, some of my Bibles that I use when I teach and preach. And it's interesting to me, when I put my dad's Bible on the coffee table by next Sunday, that Bible's got dust on it. <laughs> okay, so if you're not using your Bible, you're fighting a battle without a weapon. And none of us here would ever fight a battle without a weapon. Okay, at least I hope you would never do that. And so he's telling you here to put the full armor on, not just pieces, but full. Praying without the word doesn't really do it because guess what? Unless you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you may not know what to pray. Uh, in this Bible I have here, I, it's, I marked all my main prayers in here. This book is a book of prayers. Okay, and so what, how do I know what God wants me to pray? It will show me in this word that will help my heart come in align with God, okay? Word without praying, that doesn't do any good either, okay? Fasting without prayer and without uh, the word, it doesn't work. You have to put on the full, and the Greek word uh, means panoplia, which means offense and defense. Uh, I used to be a martial arts instructor, and you, uh, one of the things I used to always tell my students was, uh, you can't win, tell me a sport you win without scoring a goal or a touchdown, or getting a run? And the answer is zero. There are no sports that you can win without being offensive. As a Christian, you need the Word of God in Use that as an offensive weapon, okay? You have, to, you have to stand up. You have to resist, okay? If you don't, like I said, the, do, the devil, he's not here just to trick you into heaven. He wants to devour you, okay? Uh, everybody knows who Michael Jordan is, right? Okay. What made Michael Jordan so great? And in, in the fourth quarter, if they were ahead by 30 points, he stepped on your throat. Okay. He devoured his opponents. He never let up. If you watch sports nowadays, you can see the ebb and flow of most games. Okay. And that's what the devil's trying to do to you. He's trying to devour you. He wants to step on you. Okay. Ephesians 6, 12. This is a very uh, prolific, because here, as we go through the Bible, this is a history book for us. Daniel didn't have a Bible when he was going through what he was going through with Nebuchadnezzar. Isaiah did not know that the Messiah was going to come. He did not have the book of Isaiah, okay? This is a book of history and prophecy. This is the only book in any religion that has prophecy in it. All the other religions do not have prophecy in their books, because why? They can be proven wrong. The seven-day Adventists, twice now they've made the prediction of the coming of Jesus Christ. And guess what? Twice they've been wrong. So why would I listen to anything else they teach? Okay? Or I'm sorry, Jehovah Witnesses. I apologize. They're not seven-day Adventists. Okay? And so, in verse 12, For you are wrestling. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. If, and I, I don't mean to insult anybody, but you can see the spiritual warfare taking place in your nation right now amongst our leaders, okay? There is wickedness in high places. And where is this coming from? It's coming from the spirit of the devil. It's coming against from the principalities of the devil. Think of the devil as having, I recommend to everybody to read C.S. Lewis's screw tape letters. Uh, he wrote it back in the 40s. He's talking uh, about, he writes a letter talking about how a young demon is dealing with Christians. And it talks about how the demon writes his uh, uncle and they go through this hierarchy. The devil has a hierarchy set up that uh, is made to do war against you. Remember, the devil's not omnipresent. He can't be everywhere like God can. So the devil right now is where he can do the most against God's gospel. Wherever the God's gospel is advancing the most, that's where the devil is right now. But that doesn't mean he doesn't have some little imp to come bother your life, okay? And so we're struggling. This is, in this verb in Greek, it tells us to contest, okay? Pele. We are contesting unrighteousness. Are you contesting unrighteousness in your life? Uh, when people walk up to you, uh, do they start telling you dirty jokes at work? Or do they, when you walk in the room, they go, oh, I'm not going to say that dirty joke because I know you don't want to hear it. Are you contesting that? Okay. Are you contesting when somebody says something you know is blatantly against the word of God? 
are you wrestling with that? Or are you tolerant of it? You know, we're, we're, some believers are loving people right into hell right now with their tolerance of sexual immorality in our society, okay? And it doesn't matter whether it's adultery, fornication, homosexuality, and, you know, all the other things that are taking place in our society, the child uh, pornography, the pedophilia, it's all wrong, okay? And when you see somebody who's doing that, you need to take them aside and just explain to them, hey, this is what the Word of God says. Or when they start speaking out in the public square, you have just as much right to speak out in the public square of America, too, to tell your point of view, too. Just because we have the Christian point of view and the Word of God does not mean that I don't have a right as an American to speak what the truth is. In 1 Timothy 1.18, this charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before on thee, that thou mightest war a good warfare. What are you called to do? You're called to war. You're not called as a Christian to have an easy life and uh, live in America where we get to eat whatever we want to today after church. You know, uh, you, you are called to do warfare. One day we're going to all stand in front of God at the Bema seat. We're not going to be judged for our sins because those have been blotted out. But God, Jesus is going to ask you, what did you do after you knew of me? What did you do? Did you feed my brother? Did you tell people that you're a Christian? That's why I'm not going to do what you guys are doing. That's why I don't want to be around that. Did you speak the word of Jesus to people? It doesn't mean you have to preach, okay? Remember what St. Francis of Assisi said, spread the gospel, and if you need to, use words. Your, your kind acts and deeds and how you treat people is how you honor God and show who you are. Ephesians 6.13, Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. Okay, so in college, when I was in college, they always told us that whenever the professor said something twice, you were to write it down. So here we see that we've been told to put and we're to take the whole armor of God. It says it there twice, once in 11 and once in 13. The whole armor of God. Why? That you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all you can to stand. There is evil amongst the world right now, okay? There's evil in this land right now. You need to withstand it. You cannot withstand it unless you have the full armor of God. The Greek word stand, anthestema, means to oppose, resist, stand out against. Again, here we are called to stand up. Um, you know, with my hunting buddies, they knew that I wasn't going to go drinking with them. And they would say that, hey, we're going to go drinking. You know, you know we, we don't want you to have to come with us, Dave. We understand that you don't drink, okay? And I'm not putting down alcohol, okay? Because alcohol is, is in and of itself is an objective uh, object object it's what i do with whatever i have that makes it a sin okay all things are expedient for me but all things all things are lawful for me but not all things are expedient okay so you know and i'm going to zap some people now it might be better if you brought your your bible to church than a cell phone because a non-believer sees you use your bible on your cell phone what do you think he thinks it's just another app just another app on the phone it's not really that important to you, this Christianity stuff. I can look, download that app on my phone. How people know what you are for or against, I mean, what, do they know what your stance is on abortion? Do they know what your stance is on same-sex marriage? What about sex out of wedlock, sex before we're married? What about fornication? What about homosexuality? Do they know where you stand? I don't stand for anything except it's in the Word of God, okay? And I'm not trying to condemn anybody because my sins, I don't even want to talk about them. That's how ashamed of them I am. But I know I've been washed in the Lamb, okay? And so people need to know where you stand. You need to, hey, I don't want to do this because I believe in what the Word of God is, okay? And so you're to resist. You're to oppose. You have to do that. Nobody can do it for you. Just because your parents were in church and grandma prayed for you, which is great. Grandmothers, pray for your kids. I'm living proof that I'm alive. I should either be dead. Those that know me know I should either be dead or in prison right now. Okay? 
but for praying grandmothers. You are covering your kids, and 60 years is nothing. 40 years is nothing. Whatever they come back to the Lord, remember with God, one day is, is a thousand years, and a thousand years is just one day. There is no time with God, okay? So you keep praying. You be the one for them, okay? So we're to oppose and we're to resist. Second Peter 3.17, Ye therefore, beloved, seeing you know these things, you know these things because you're sitting here with me right now, before, beware, lest ye also being allayed, led away with the air of the wicked fall from your steadfastness. Continue to take the whole armor. This is a daily thing. Uh, my funnest, you know, I, the guys at work, they're funny because I'm going to go. I took Friday off. To, uh, I needed time to prepare for this. And uh, when I get to work on Monday, the first thing the dudes are all going to run up to me and go, what would you do this weekend? And I'm going to tell them the same thing I always tell them. I read the word. I got into the word. Okay. And so what are you savoring in your life? What does your heart desire? And that will tell you where your walk is right now with the Lord. Are you trying to seek the Lord first thing when you get up in the morning? Are you like David when you go to bed at night, you seek the Lord? Or do you have other things in your life that have a higher priority of them than this? Okay. So what are you savoring? What are you actually after? Anybody can stumble. Anybody can fall. And, uh, you know, when I, when I was talking earlier about opposing things, the Lord spoke to me about this, and it was really uh, prolific in my life. I used to stay up and watch the show Cheers. And uh, there was a bartender, and his name was Sam, and he just chased women. And the Lord finally said to me, you know, you're tired all the time. Why are you watching that anyways? And I said to the Lord, what do you mean? And he goes, well, these people are celebrating fornication, Dave. So you're watching a show that you should be opposing, and they are celebrating fornication, and you're celebrating right along them. And it changed my mentality upon what I watch on TV now, okay? I don't watch Seinfeld. He's funny as all get out, but what's Seinfeld? What is George and uh, Jerry always trying to do? They're trying to fornicate, okay? Uh, you start watching The Big Bang Theory. What are all the young men in these, movie, these uh, comedies trying to do? have sexual relationships with women outside of marriage. That is not godly, okay? That is not godly. And so we need to stand up as Christians and say, why do I, why do I not want you having sex outside of marriage? Because I don't want you young lady getting pregnant. And now you don't have anybody to support you. Now you're going to have to make a real huge choice because now somebody's going to come at you that's called the devil and he's going to tell you, man, just kill that kid. Get rid of it. It's inconveniencing you, Okay? And so now we can see how sin, when it takes place, it blossoms, okay? And so we have to oppose this. Verse 14, there's that word again. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness. Girt means buckled. Uh, the Greek word I can't pronounce, I don't think this one, parakaibo, which means to hide, keep from sight. Um, this truth should be inside of you, okay? It's not the truth of the Pharisees who stood up and said, hey, I'm fasting, everybody. I'm fasting today. Hey, uh, they, they, the, the, they had these big brass or gold uh, jars. And when the Pharisees would go into the temple, they'd put their money in there and they'd make sure it jingled that you could hear it. Look at me, jingle, 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 okay? And so this truth needs to be inside your heart, okay? How is that truth to be seen? It's in your sincerity, okay? We need to, we, the, the truth of God should be upholding my heart. I, I'll be honest with you, I, I hit 60 yesterday and I'm feeling good. I'm feeling good. Uh, I, I thought about, you know, the Lord says give you, he gives us a desire as a heart. And when Pastor called me, I was like, oh, that is so cool. God gave me a birthday present. I can preach on Sunday. Uh, and I love to share the word, okay? Um, but this truth should be upholding in your day and out day life. When that guy cuts you off on the highway, you should be thinking, man, he's having a worse day than I am. Look how fast he has to drive. Look, he has no concern for other people. 
Uh, you know, when people take that shopping cart from you and bump you in the line or cut you off, you know, we should be looking upon them with compassion. The truth is, is I am a sinner. I'm saved by the blood of the Lamb, okay? And I'm going to have eternal life one day. Eternal life, six billion years from now, I'm going to stand up and still be in God's presence, okay? Six billion years from now, those people that have rejected the Lord Jesus Christ are going to be without hope in hell for eternity okay so that's a truth the other truth is you have God okay God didn't create you just to watch you like a little Paul oh, look Dave fell down today <laughs> that's not God God sees me stumble he immediately puts his hand out to try and catch me okay God tries to guide me so that I don't go down the path the word is a lamp unto my feet if I am in the word the Lord is guiding my feet I will not stumble okay but if I'm not in the world word I'm going to be in the world, I will stumble, okay? God desires truth and sincerity in our inner parts. Um, I do this thing with the Messianic Jews on Sunday where we read the Torah, the Haftra, and the Brit Kadashah. And it was interesting to me today that, and the Lord always does this, it's so cool, because I've had to talk with pastor before where we don't even talk during the week, but whatever we're doing is coordinated by the Holy Spirit without us even saying anything to us. But in Micah 6.8, it talks about what the Lord would have you do. Um, and I'm going to go there real quick. Just to share this with you. Uh, Micah is talking to the Israelites. Uh, they've been sinning against God. And they're about to get the hammer dropped on them. And they don't understand what's taking place. And in uh, Micah 6.8, it's one of the most prophetic prophecies that's in the Bible. It's one of the greatest sayings, okay? It's in there in three places. But it says, um, He has showed thee, O man, what is good. God has showed us what is good. What does the Lord require of thee? But to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Okay? And so how, how I show God that I'm sincere is I'm humble. How I show God that I'm sincere is I have truth, I have justice, and I have mercy, okay? And that's what God desires. He, does, he doesn't care what you look like on the outside. He wants to see what you look like on the inside. This truth holds everything together, okay? It's going to hold all your other pieces of armor on. My wife bought me a little Roman soldier once, and we think it's so cool because it's put on the whole armor of God. I was going to bring it today. But it shows how that, that belt of truth holds on the breastplate. It holds the sword. It holds the shield. It holds the helmet, okay? You are righteous because God has imputed his righteousness to you, okay? When Jesus died on the cross, his blood washed you, and God's Holy Spirit came in you. Uh, you're, whenever you sin, you're sinning against yourself because the Holy Spirit's inside you right now. God is inside you. You are righteous because God has said you are righteous. And we look to Peter when he was saying, Lord, I have not touched any unclean thing. And what did God tell him? Anything I say is clean is clean. And so you are all righteous because of Jesus Christ and God. You also have his salvation. The second part of that verse is the breastplate of righteousness. The breastplate protects all the vital organs, lungs, your heart, your stomach, okay? Again, it's, it's a put on. It's a verb. It says put on um, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness. What does that mean to be righteous? I used to always worry about that because Jesus said, except your righteousness exceed the righteousness of the Pharisees, you shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. I'd go, Ugh, I'm not getting in, huh? And it's not about getting in. It's about loving God, okay? This is about loving God. But what does righteous mean? It, righteousness mean? It means you're virtuous and devout. Can your boss trust you with the money at work? Do you show up to work on time or when you want to get there? Okay. Are you devoted? Are you a devout person? Are you fair and equitable? Okay. When your mother gives you uh, something to share with your brother or your sister, do you share it? Or do you keep two for yourself and give one to your brother and sister? Okay. Are you fair and equitable with what God's giving you? You know, uh, we had this debate at work amongst the non-believers. Well, I'm not giving something to that guy. He might get drunk. And I was like, how do you know that uh, he's going to get drunk? 
You don't know what that homeless guy is going to do. But you got a lot of money. You're sitting here with a job. You ain't out on the street. You got food in your belly. You sleep in a warm bed. So just giving him a couple bucks it doesn't, is not no big deal. You should be fair and equitable. Do you do everything with integrity and virtue? Uh, do you tell everybody the truth? Or do you, when you need to, you, you tell it so that it makes you look good? Um, I'll be honest with you. My bosses hate me. I'm not allowed to be around uh, uh, the customers because I just tell them the truth. Okay? Yeah, the swimming pool should be over there. It's not in the trees. It's in the sun. You won't have to heat it. If you put it over here, it'll be a, behind the shadow of the house. It'll be in the trees. You'll have to clean it. Okay? And so you, you, should, want, you should want to have that type of righteousness. You should be generous and have alms. You know, it's always interesting to me the... Uh, the Greek word, it says in the Bible, do not your alms before men to be seen of them. Uh, the Greek word alms means merciful deeds. Do you do your merciful deeds for everybody to see you? Do you want attention every time you do something? Or you just do it because you want to help people out? That's righteousness, okay? Piety and godliness justification and sanctification as I've been telling my Bible study class sorry Lord it's not my Bible study class it's yours um, you guys are all justified already you know that you've all been justified by the blood of the lamb now you need to be getting sanctified and getting sanctified means getting into the word putting on the whole armor of God so that you can be what God has created you to be that you can do and find the will of God in your life and I'll get onto that later on about peace Okay, so are you virtuous? Are you devout? Are you fair and equitable? Are, do you have integrity? Do you have virtue, generosity, alms, piety, and godliness, justified and sanctified? This is what it means to put on the breastplate of righteousness. Verse 15, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. This is one of my favorite ones. Roman soldiers had hobnails in their sandals so they could grip the ground. I don't know if you're familiar with war, ancient warfare, uh, but the Greeks had a phalanx system. They'd lock all their shields together, and then they'd just start pushing with these long spears, and they'd just kind of walk over you. And you, if you didn't have uh, shoes that you could take into the ground, they just would push you backwards until you fell down. When you fell down, they'd stab you and keep marching. The Romans had a thing called a turtle where they'd take all the shields, they'd lock them on top, lock them on the bottom, and they'd do the same thing the Greeks would do, but it would be a smaller thing. But they were all fighting on open terrain. Sometimes it was rainy, sometimes it was muddy. And so their feet had to have these hobnails in them so they could grip the ground. Even nowadays, you know, I'm always amazed. I got out of the military in 85. Just the technology. Uh, you know, I'll ask you guys a question. What do you think is the most important thing that's changed in the military since I've been out? With the, which, I don't even know to do the math there. 25 years, 30 years. Hey, you, you'll never guess what the most important thing is. Knee pads. Because if you have knee pads, you can drop straight to the ground, and you won't hurt your knees. Okay? One of the first things that happens in a firefight, combat, you better get on the ground, especially if the shells start flying. You better get on the ground. Okay? And back in my day, we didn't have knee pads. So when you fell on the ground, there was a rock stuck in your knee, and then, of course, you got infected, and you had to deal with that. Okay? And so even modern armies now protect their feet with boots. Okay? And the interesting thing is, in Jesus' day, a lot of people went barefoot. Okay? It wasn't like us Americans where, you know, I, I was laughing. Just, I got, me and my wife, were, she was trying to buy me something. I tried to explain to her I didn't know the size because nowadays who knows what size the shoes are because it depends where the company, the shoes come from. Uh, in, in China, I'm considered a giant. And uh, here, I'm not considered that. Uh, and so you, she was trying to buy me a pair of slippers and she wanted to know, are you 8, 10, or 12? And I was like, I don't know. My boots are 11s. My tennis shoes are 10s. You know, when we were kids, there were, you knew what your shoe size was because it was only Converse. You couldn't go to a Foot Locker. There was no Foot Locker. You went to the store, they had your size, or they didn't, and that was it. Okay, but nowadays there's Foot Locker, you know, thousands of shoes. And so, you know, here's Americans. These are one of the things we need to look at about why we should feel blessed, okay? And so they were lucky in those days to have one pair of sandals. I must confess, I have a bunch of shoes. Uh, most of the time I'm either in boots or flip-flops. Um, this preparation showed they were prepared for all the terrain they would encounter. Okay, so they might be in snow one day. They might be in desert the next. They might be... Uh, in, on the beach, okay, they might be in Rocky, but they had these, they sh their feet 
we're prepared, okay? If you're not getting up in the morning and preparing yourself for doing battle, guess what? You're already behind the ball. I have guys at work that show up, they don't eat till 10. I can tell when 10 o'clock is because their energy is gone. Would you, did you eat breakfast this morning? No, I need to eat. It's like, well, I can tell why you don't, you're lethargic, okay? So you need to, to prepare yourself. The, these, the, they also, uh, the footwear protects the soldiers from traps and, and sharp sticks. The devil's, be realistic, the devil's trying to trap you up right now, okay? He's not waiting until you leave church. He's trying right now to trap you up. Okay, And so this preparation just is something that we need to do. It signifies a prepared and resolved frame of heart to adhere to the gospel and abide in it. Okay, If I say I love God, but I don't love his word, do I really love God? And that's a quote from Charles Spurgeon, one of the uh, most listened to pastors of all time. Okay, I have... Uh, and we're going to be held more accountable than anybody else's because we have the Bible. The Jews had the Tanakh. Uh, the apostles, they did not have a Bible, okay? Uh, we have the whole Bible. We are not going to be able to stand uh, before God and say, I never heard your name before. I don't know who you are. How many churches are there here in Seaside? 28? You can't drive down in Hillby without hitting a church every other block, okay? And so you need to prepare your heart, okay? You need to you show God put forth the effort okay God didn't say God says when you when you seek me with all your heart you will find me okay and then be prepared because he's gonna start talking and then you're gonna have to start doing what he says okay <laughs> this also enables me to walk steadily as I go through the day I, I know that the minute I get done with my prayers and devotions in the morning the spiritual attacks start the, the devil immediately starts because who are you going to share the good word with today? It should be your coworkers. Every one of your coworkers should know what you're, that you're a Christian. And not just because you smack them over the head with the Bible scriptures. They should know you're a Christian because you're the generous, kind, putting them first person all the time on the job site. Okay? You should be the person that loans. In the trades, nobody likes to loan out tools. My job box, they, these guys will unlock their job boxes take a tool out and lock the job box right back up. And then they'll go back and forth all day long. My job box is open. They know that they can get any tool they want to use. All that I ask is you put it back when you're done with it and that if you break it, you let me know so that I can replace it. This is how we show God's love by the actions that we do to people, okay? The, your children, your parents, are going to hammer you right now. You know, it says in Deuteronomy when the you shall teach your children when you sit with them, when you walk with them, when you talk with them. You should be the one teaching your children, not our Sunday school teachers, not our pastor, not me. You guys should be teaching your children. You're the ones that should be preparing your children for the battle that that generation, your generation is in right now and that you're going to be in, okay? The gospel of peace is called so because we are at peace with God. We are at peace with ourselves and with one another. Uh, the great uh, Francis Schaeffer wrote that. When I talk with anybody, I have to have a presupposition of where they're coming from. If they're non-believers, they're coming with no hope. So what do they turn to? They turn to things of the world, drugs, material things, uh, sex, rock and roll. They turn to everything. Okay, because they have no hope. But you and I, we have that truth. We have that hope. Whatever happens to me today is going to be nothing compared to the fact that I'm going to be in the presence of God for eternity. Okay? John 14, 27. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let your heart not be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Okay? The peace of the world passes. I bet you if I ask everybody right now to bring out money that you guys can all know what the money looks like, right? It's just a piece of paper. <laughs> so many people put their trust in that little piece of paper. What does it say on all the money in America? In God we trust, okay? So when you start to trust in God and you start to see God move, guess what? You're going to, it's like a catch-22. Most of people 
probably don't know what Catch-22 is. Again, that's a generational thing. Uh, during World War II, the number one units that were taking the most damage were the bombers. They were getting shot out of the sky left and right. So they couldn't get the guys to fly the plane. So they would tell them, well, if you flew 22 missions, you'd get to go home. Well, the catch was nobody could make it to 22. Okay, But with God, that 22 works. That catch 22 works. Because the more I give of what God gives to me, the more he replaces. God can't refuel, refill me unless I'm pouring out. Okay, If you have any type of jar and you put water in it, it's going to go stagnant. But when you pour that water out and you put fresh water in, it's cool and clean. And we need to keep doing that, okay? He tells us uh, to not be troubled. How many people are troubled right now by the news? I don't know because I don't show you turn the news on. I, you can ask my wife. I only watch one guy at 5 o'clock for five minutes because he makes me laugh, okay? Don't be troubled. Uh, Sister Becky sent me a thing the other day. I'm sorry I didn't respond to you. Um, <laughs> but uh, it, says in, uh, it says in Matthew, take no thought for your life. When you seek the righteousness of God, all the other things fall into place. Okay? And I, most of you guys here probably don't remember Major. He was lieutenant commander in the military. But when, you, you, when you're in line with God, you have peace. Uh, everything falls into place. You have healthy, healed relationships. Okay, And this is what the Lord gives you. You should have the peace of the fact that if I die today, I'm going to heaven. So who cares? Uh, not that I don't like you guys and don't want to be with you guys, but it'd be, it's going to be cool to be with Jesus. Okay, And you know, think of all the people you're going to meet. Uh, I didn't grow up with my grandparents, so I'm going to get to meet my grandfathers. Okay, My grandfather died when I was a baby. Um, I guess you're going to get to meet Adam and go, what were you thinking, Adam? You know, you're going to get to meet the Apostle Paul. You're going to meet Job find out, you know, Job was a mighty warrior. I never knew that until I started studying the scriptures. I just thought he was this feeble old man. He wasn't. He was a mighty warrior before all that stuff happened to him, okay? So don't be troubled. Don't be afraid, okay? It says don't be afraid. Uh, God has not given me a spirit of fear. He has given me a spirit of power and might, okay? And I'm going to use it. Our anchor is in the gospel, you should be anchored on the word of Jesus, okay? The good news, that you have salvation through the Lord Jesus Christ. And then we're going to get on to verse 16. Above all, okay, he's telling us above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Okay, what's the important thing about the shield? Everybody seen Braveheart? Okay. What happens in Braveheart? They shoot the arrows, they just stand behind the shield. And let the shield take the arrows. Jesus' faith will take the arrows of the wicked one, okay? Whenever you are struggling with anything, say, Jesus, help me. And guess who's, whose battle it is now? It's Jesus' battle from that instant on. And guess what? He's going to take care uh, of whatever situation you're in. If you're in the middle of the storm, he will calm you. Remember that God puts you in a storm sometimes because it knocks all your enemies away from you. Sometimes God puts you in troubled waters because your enemies can't swim, okay? And so you're in a storm for a reason. It's to grow my faith in God and to glorify God, okay? So this is the most necessary of all armor parts, for it will be all in all to us in our hour of temptation. You will be tempted. Your temptations are going to change. I have no desire to do drugs anymore. I have no desire to be sexually immoral. I have no desire to do most of the sins of the flesh anymore. Okay? I am occasionally angry. I am occasionally lazy. Uh, sometimes I do covet. Okay? Um, but the shield of faith will help me get through all these things. Okay? It should be everything to me. Faith is the thing not seen in the substance of things hoped for. Faith, having received Christ and the benefits of redemption. And so driving grace from Jesus like a shield. Okay, uh, I was raised in a legalistic church. And back when, in our days, there would be wooden pews here. All the kids would be sitting here, stone cold, not moving. Okay, uh, we weren't allowed to dance. We weren't allowed to go to movies. Uh, 
uh, on Sunday after church, you went in your room and slept, and then you got ready to go back to church that night, okay? And so we were always learning about the fear of God. I was afraid of God. Oh, you saw what I did. Ah, you know, but that's not God. No matter what you do, God's grace is greater than your sin. You're going to stumble throughout the day. Turn to the Lord and say, hey, I'm sorry for that. And guess what? The Lord's going to help you so that you don't do that anymore. And he will forgive you instantly on that spot. Okay? The loving kindness of God is renewed each and every day. But his mercy endures forever. It does not have to be renewed. Whatever Satan throws at me, I have God's grace. Okay? Um... I don't know how Job did this, but though he slay me, I will still pray to him. <laughs> this, this is after he's lost all his 5,000 camel, his 5,000 sheep, all his house, all his children, his friends. He's got squash, he's got scabs, and he's, the dogs are licking and scraping. His friends are calling him a sinner. I know you did something wrong. Repent because God only punishes you if you've sinned, okay? And so, but I have God's grace to get through all that, okay? God's grace is greater than anything. His loving kindness is better than life. Satan is the accuser who stands before God accusing us day in and day night, okay? But remember that Jesus is standing right there as a shield. He's saying, Dad, don't, don't listen to him. David, he confessed that sin to me a long time ago. He's, he's, he's one of my children now. And so when you stand in front of God, Satan's going to go, remember when he did that? And God's going to go, no, I don't remember that, okay? It says in the Bible that as far as the east are from the west, that's how God remembers your sins. If I go north and I get to the northernmost point of the earth, I'm headed south again. And then once I get south, I'm headed north again. East and west never meet. If you're going east, you're always going east. If you're going west, you're always going west. And then the other thing to remember, too, is, is uh, when I write on this paper, I can see the words uh, imprinted. If I erase it, I can still see the words. In the ancient time, they used uh, uh, animal skin to write on. And so whenever the animal skin was so valuable that when they wanted to write again, they would take water and wipe off whatever ink they had written on there. You had no idea what was on that piece of parchment before. And so when God says that he will blot out all your sins, he don't remember them anymore. So you shouldn't remember anymore either. Because the devil's going to tell you, hey, eat that cookie. Eat that cookie. Eat that cookie. And then you're going to eat the cookie, and then he's going to go, what'd you eat that cookie for? Look at you. You ate that cookie. Okay? And so don't let him play that game with you. Whatever sins that you have confessed to the Lord Jesus Christ and you've laid down here at this altar and repented from, they're, they're gone. So when any time he brings it up, so I don't know what you're talking about. Expect fiery darts. Expect to be attacked. Uh, the wit word for wicked is poneros. It means unsound, bad, afflictive, wrongful, malignant. It means threatening danger, malevolent, wishing evil on you. The devil wishes evil on you, okay? Expect the darts to happen. Um, if you're always walking around unaware, which most, it's always amazing to me. Uh, part of my life, I grew up in New York City, sixth grade and 11th and 12th grade. And this is in the, uh, New York City in the 70s when it was not like it is now. It was a very dangerous place. It's always amazing to me to see people walking with their cell phone. They have no clue and they walk right out in front of a car and get hit, okay? Expect as a believer that you're going to be getting fiery darts. Sometimes they're unexpected and they come from all directions. Uh, they're going to wound you deeply, you know, and the combat of old darts and arrows were flying around everywhere in the battlefield. And so you're fighting this guy in front of you with a sword, and all of a sudden an arrow comes flying out of nowhere. You have to expect that the devil is going to attack you, okay? There, if you're not being attacked by the devil, there might be something wrong with your walk right now, okay? You might, you might think, remember the greatest deception is not that we deceive others, but that we deceive ourselves. When I stand in front of God, it's going to be the unblinded truth. All the lies that I believed about myself being handsome, good-looking, fast, strong, they're all going to be wiped away, okay? The only truth that's going to be there is God's truth, and that's it. Those darts are going to inflame you. 
Now, some of us have been struck with darts that go back to childhood, okay? And uh, we, we used to, we dealt with that in uh, cleansing stream, uh, the, the sins of our youth. But your faith should quench them, okay? You are a new creature in Christ. You are a new being. Uh, my body's getting old. I can't do a lot of stuff I used to do, but I can't wait till one day I can fly. And, you know, we're going to have bodies like Jesus, and he went right through the wall. Okay? He, and I, I just can't wait for that. So you're, believe the things that are in this. In the, this is not a fairy tale. Okay? Um, it's interesting to me. The Bible has been around, as we know it, for almost 2,000 years. Uh, to Tanakh for uh, about 7,000 years. You know, the most in- intelligent people in the history of the human race, everyone that's tried to prove this Bible incorrect has failed. No one has been able to scientifically prove that this book is false. Better men have tried and failed. And it says that they're not going to be able to do that, okay? 2 Corinthians 10, 4 through 6, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God, bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Jesus. You know, right there, who's exalting themselves against God? The non-believers. Those guys that say, I don't need God. I'm man. We can fix our problems. And you know, the only thing we've learned from man is that man can't solve his problems, okay? Who else exalts himself against God? Satan, okay? And that's a hard one for me. You know, I don't know how I'm going to deal with this in heaven because I'm not going near a saint, to be honest with you. You know, he'll, he'll be in hell and I'll be like, man, you seen God? God created you and you were with him in heaven and you think you can beat him? Wow, well, at least I'm stupid because I'm down here on earth. <laughs> you were up in heaven with him, okay? But we're to cast these down. Everything that exalts itself against the gospel, everything that exalts it against God, what am I to do? I'm to cast it down, okay? I'm not to put it in the shelf and, you know, um, you know, I've watched pornography. I'll just put this tape away. I won't watch it anymore. No. You need to cast that thing out of your house. Every unclean thing that's ca- causing you to stumble, you need to cast it away. Okay? You need to get rid of it. If it's drugs, flush it down the toilet. If it's alcohol, flush it down the toilet. If it's your friends, okay, uh, stay away from them because they're not your friends. Okay? Stay away from them. They're not your friends. Cast them down. Hey, I can't go out with you guys on Friday night because you guys all get drunk and we get in fights. I'm not going to go out and get drunk and get in a fight with you guys anymore. Okay? I'm not going to try and, and, and stand on my own. I'm going to listen to what the Lord tells me to do and just get rid of this stuff. Okay? Capturing every thought. Again, as Rabbi Schneider says, he's a Messianic Jew um, who says the battle's in our mind. Okay? The battle starts in your mind. The sin starts in your mind. Okay? And then it proceeds either through the tongue where I hurt somebody or it proceeds through my deeds and my actions, okay? Faith pulls down and casts down the adversary, okay? Remember, God created the devil, okay? He is a created being. Capture your thoughts, and that's what our faith should do. Base your faith on the word of God and your own testimony. How many people in here are saved? How many people have been saved from addiction? okay from the bondage of sin all of us you got your witness right there that's your faith right there you know that the word of god describes who god is and what better way to learn who god is than by his own word okay faith in who he is what he has done and what he is doing and what he is going to do jesus is coming back i tell the guys all the time jesus is coming back they're like that's cool and i go no not for you it ain't uh, cuz cuz he ain't coming back to save you he's coming back to wipe you out i mean it, Again, we're loving so many people right into hell. Jesus is coming again because he's not coming to, to love and to give us salvation. He's coming to conquer, okay? He's already given us the chance for his love. God says his word shall never be broken and endures forever. John 10, 36 is one of my favorite verses. Scripture cannot be broken. No scripture has ever been broken. The word of God has stood all this time. Where are the Romans at? Where are the Assyrians? Where are the, where's the English Empire? Where are the great shoguns? Where's Alexander? Only thing that stood the test of time is the Word of God, okay? 
Matthew 5, 18, and God makes a promise here. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law, till all be fulfilled. When Jesus comes back again, the word will finally be fulfilled. Heaven, excuse me, and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass. 1 Peter 1, 25, but the word of God endures forever. Guess what? That is the most truthful saying uh, you could ever imagine. Uh, this word is going to endure forever. I'll be dead and gone. The word will still be here. Your, your, your grandfather was here. He's dead and gone. The word is still here. Every great man in history, uh, most people I, I always like to, uh, you know, do this. Who is the 21st president? I don't know. Guess what? He's gone. But guess what? The word was here when he was here. The word is here right now. The word's going to be here when he, when I am gone. In the Bible, God dispersed. This is just one example of the power of God. God told the Jews in Deuteronomy, uh, these are the blessings, and these are the curses. And they didn't listen. So God dispersed them per his word, says he's going to do this, to the Jews, to the Hebrews, throughout the world. Okay, if you guys believe on me and obey me, I'll bring you back in together. Like I said, all these empires have come and gone. In as a human, only one nation has ever disappeared, come back to the same land, come back with the same religion and the same language. And you know why that is? Because God said it was going to happen. Okay, and God does these things and uses Israel so it proves His word. Okay. The Bible is full of prophecies. I think two-thirds of them have come true right now is, I think, what we're at. Um, and so you can trust this word of God because he has said something in the day of Isaiah, and it has happened now. It's not prophecy anymore. It's history. Okay? Isaiah 11, 12, and it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall set his hand again a second time to recover his people. This is living proof of the truth of the scriptures. Okay? Why is faith important? Because in Hebrews 11:6, without faith it is impossible to please God. You have to act upon the word of God. Okay? You have to act upon Jesus' grace that it's going to quench the fiery darts of the wicked, of temptation. Okay? And then we're going to finish up with verses 17 and 18. Verse 17, take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Um, helmet of salvation, you're saved. Simple. You are saved, period. You don't have to jump up and down or get beat on the back or say 50 million Hail Marys, not offending my Catholic brothers out there. Uh, you don't have to do nothing, sacrifice a goat, pig. You just got to accept. That's all you have to do. Accept the fact that you are a sinner who needs salvation, okay? Hope. The devil will tempt us to despair, but God, good hope, trust in God, rejoicing in him. Joy comes from knowing the Lord. Uh, most of you guys don't remember Pastor Steve. Uh, when he left here, one of the things he always told me is nobody can take your joy. People can take your happiness because your happiness is dependent upon your circumstances. But your joy should be in the Lord. The joy of the Lord is my strength, okay? God's happy with me. I don't care. Sorry to say that, but <laughs> really don't care about a lot of other things. Now, because I am a Christian and I follow the Lord, I love and care for my companions. But the main thing to me is that my joy comes from knowing God. The sword of the Spirit is the most important thing because it's the only offensive weapon, okay? Uh, I talked with you earlier about how you can't you can't win a, any type of a sport without scoring, okay? Um and it, it's always interesting to me because uh, my favorite uh, words, there's three of them that are written throughout. Those that study Bible with me know um, my favorite words are, it is written, okay? And it's throughout the New Testament. Uh, Jesus used it when he fought the devil. Paul uses it like 23 times. Uh, Peter used it. What are they talking about? They're talking about the Old Testament, Okay. We're not just here for the New Testament. We're here for the whole kit and caboodle, okay? The whole Bible, okay? Use this word. It doesn't do any good to have a sword, and it's not sharp. Because then all you end up doing is beating your opponent to death. You want to cut him and be done with it, okay? 
And so how did Jesus score by repeating the word of God as he did his in temptation? You know, in that temptation, when he was saying to the devil, it is written. He says it four times. Even the devil turned to him and said, okay, isn't it written? Uh, that's how powerful scripture is, okay? When you use scripture, whatever you're using it for or against must come under the authority of God because God does not lie. God's promises stand, okay? But it also accounts you have to be obedient to him. You have to be being obedient. If you're not being obedient to the Lord, repent that sin to the Lord, give it to him, and start that battle to get rid of it. The sword protects you from deception. Jesus said, many shall come in my name, saying, I am the Christ. I mean, I, I don't, I know so many people are deceived nowadays. Uh, the prosperity gospel, God never said he's going to make you rich. He said he'll bless you. He didn't say he was going to bless you with a house in Pebble Beach and a Mercedes Benz or whatever people like. He said he's going to bless you with salvation and eternal life. And that should be good enough for me, okay? We have to stand on God's word. But if I don't know who God is, how can I stand on him? If I, don't know, if I don't know God, how am I going to stand on him? I'm going to fall every time. And that was my problem as a young Christian. I didn't know the word. Um, I love my parents to death, but in some areas they failed as Christians. Uh, one of the things we need to do is when it says in Deuteronomy, talk with your children. Share the word with them, okay, so that they will know it. And again, I'm going to quote what Charles Spurgeon said. How can you love God if you don't love his word? Okay, it just doesn't happen. And, and this sword protects us from uh, deception because Matthew 24, 4 says, take heed that you be not deceived. A lot of Christians are deceived right now. Uh, you know, when I hear Christians say, yeah, homosexuality is okay. And I go, huh? Where is that coming from? Okay. Uh, uh, abortion's okay. Huh? Where is that coming from? Okay. Uh, it's okay that I, I, I work this job, but you're, you're working for the devil right now. You're not really glorifying God. Uh, you know, we need to really search our souls and find out whether we're doing what God wants us to do, okay? And I'm not going to know that unless I'm getting into the Word, okay? And so I, 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 pastor's been up here, you know, I don't want to say beating a dead horse, <laughs> but he's been telling everybody, you want to grow your faith? You want to really be a Christian? Uh, get into the Word. And remember this, for those of you guys that are on the, the fence, Jesus said it's better not to be on the fence, he said it's better for you to be hot or cold than to not be on the fence. So it's worse for you to, to pretend. Uh, you know, don't pretend. God, Jesus hates hypocrisy. He doesn't want your words to say one thing, but your heart to be someplace else. First or 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is given by the inspiration of God. All scripture, not just the New Testament, not just the Old Testament. You know, in battle, you divide and conquer. Guess what the devil did? He divided the Christians and the Jews. The Jews believe in the Old Testament. The Christians believe in the New Testament. And go back and forth, okay? It's all Scripture, okay? And when Paul writes this to Timothy, there is no New Testament. There's only the Old Testament. So when he says all Scripture is given by the inspiration of God, it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction, and righteousness. We need the word of God to know what righteousness is in order for us to have the breastplate of righteousness. If I don't know what the definition of righteousness is, how can I be righteous? In Hebrews 4.12, for the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and the joints and morrows. It is the center, discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. I know that work. I preach a lot try to do it in love. Sometimes you just have to tell the truth. But I know that once I start speaking the word of God, I can tell who's who's totally under the devil because they turn around and they gone. They don't stand around and ask questions. The minute they hear Jesus, they're gone. Okay? And so when you speak the word, that's what's going to happen. The sword of the spirit is so lethal because it is the Holy Spirit indicting it. The word of God, and he renders it effectual and powerful. So this word is the Holy Spirit speaking through me. I'm not speaking through you to you right now. That's the Holy Spirit of God speaking to you right now. When pastor's up here speaking, it's not pastor. It's the Holy Spirit of God. When you are motivated to read the word of God, that's not you. That's the Holy Spirit and Jesus in you doing that. It's all God that is driving all this. So do you have a sword? Are you doing battle or are you weaponless? 
It's your choice. And then I'm going to close with uh, verse 18. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Uh, I try to teach us to the Bible study. We should all be praying for each other, okay? Uh, I look out here and I see all the faces. Most of you guys, I pray for you every day because that's what God calls me to do, okay? It's not that hard to do, just to pray. It's not... <laughs> It's just saying, okay, God, Karen, I pray you bless Karen and her family. I pray you bless James and Becky. I pray you bless Saias. I pray you bless Candy and her family. It's not that hard to do. That comes down to whether I'm really willing to listen and do the little things. Remember, he who is faithful in little is faithful in much. He who is unfaithful in little is unfaithful in much. If God can't trust you, uh, you know, in I think the church has turned around. We've had this discussion many a time in the board meetings. Uh, but, if, you know, you, God can't trust you with a little money. He's not going to trust you with a big ministry at this church. Okay? Pray, pray, pray. First Thessalonians 5.17, you're to pray without ceasing. Okay? Um, that Greek word means with unvarying practice, pers persistent cough. How many people have ever had a persistent cough where you can't get rid of it? That's how you're supposed to pray. Okay? Um, Prayer is the answer. Not the answer to your prayer, but prayer is the answer, okay? And so once you pray, you should release that. A lot of times as Christians, when we do cleansing stream, uh, we have people come forward and we pray. They leave it down at the altar, and then what do they do when they walk away from the altar? They pick it right back up and take it with them, okay? Once you pray about it, it's a done deal. If you're praying in the will of God, relax. God's got it. God's going to take care of it. He's not going to leave you hanging. Uh, you know, it's interesting, uh, in the faith chapter uh, Hebrews 11, by faith, every one of those people did their thing. God didn't leave one of them hanging. And it's funny, too, in that chapter 11, because not one of them, their sins are mentioned. And every one of them in that uh, uh, chapter 11, fornicating, murder, adultery, just the, the list, lying, the list goes on and on, okay? So prayer is the answer, okay? And then I'm going to conclude. I don't know if the worship team wants to come back up here. Um, you guys want to come back up and we'll do a song? Okay. Um, those of you that, if the prayer team wants to come up here, if you, and it doesn't have to be specific prayer. Uh, we all need prayer. If you need prayer for salvation, if you want to help have prayer and growing your faith, uh, whatever you need prayer for, if the prayer team will come up, um, we will meet that need. Um, so how valuable is your soul? Your soul is so valuable that God and the devil are fighting over it right now, okay? That's how valuable you are to God. God's created billions and billions and billions and billions of people, and you're worth fighting over, okay? Uh, the devil wants your soul too. Believe it or not, uh, the devil's reaping souls right now too. Sometimes it's because of omission. It's because we didn't share the gospel, okay? And so... As long as you are alive, you're going to have warfare and you're going to have tri tribulation. Um, Rashi, I, most people have never even heard of this guy, Yitzhak Solomon. He's the guy that everybody reads the Bible from. I just found this out in the last year and have been studying this guy. You know, and he talks about, um, he's talking about Balaam and the donkey. And the reason why Balaam couldn't see the angel is because humans can't handle the spiritual world. If you were to actually see the spiritual world right now, you'd be surprised how many spirits are in this room right now. How many angels, how many wicked demons are here. We live in a creation full of spirits, okay? Abraham, Joshua, all the prophets were visited by spirit beings. Okay? And what did they do? Joshua seen the angel, boom, fell on his knees. John saw the angel, boom, fell on his knees. The angels, of course, said, hey, don't do that. You're going to get me in trouble. Because <laughs> we, we already seen what happened when this took place before in the past. Okay? And it's sad because we take spirituality so lightly. Nowadays, people go to the movies to have evil spirits scare them. And, oh, they just rescue themselves at the end of the movie. And I'll tell you right now, that ain't going to happen. Okay? That is not going to happen. That's part of the patent deception of the devil. Okay? You need God's armor to battle with the evil one and his minions. 
you get involved in a, if you're a non-believer and you get involved, you're in trouble. Okay? You're in serious trouble. Javis, Jesus gave us the Holy Spirit to dwell in us. So we're spirit beings. Remember, as Pastor Morris said, you are a spirit being having a human experience. You are not a human being having a spirit experience. You are a spirit being. How you decide to be as a spirit that God has given you is up to you. Okay? But of all things, put on the armor of God. And then as I finish up here, I don't know if pastor's going to come up here. Uh, I just want to finish with uh, number six, uh, the Aaron blessing. The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face shine on thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. Amen. Wait for it, brother. Thank you. Thank you. Well, that was deep. But he said something, brother said something, and I want to um, repeat it. The darts are going to be thrown. The enemy is active right now. I don't know if you're going to get hit, but the enemy is acting. I don't know if you're going to, he's aiming to towards your head, towards your heart, towards your feet. He's just trying to disable you. But it's really up to you, the damage. See what I'm saying? It's really up to you what type of damage that dart is going to do. He's, he never gets tired. So I'm going to ask you to stand up. If you, if you think you're being... I've been hit a few times with the darts. I'm not going to lie. And sometimes I wasn't wearing the full armor. But I'm telling you right now, right now, it's really up to you. If the enemy is it's hitting you with everything he has, we have protection. We have the armor of God and it's powerful. We're not alone. You're not alone right now. You're not alone right now. I'm telling you. So if you feel weak, come on. Let us pray for you. Let us pray with you. Because Jesus has the answer. He has the exits. He is for you. Jesus is for you right now. If you're dealing with anything, start talking to him and repent and repent and make the commitment to start wearing the full armor of God so you can stand firm. And whatever he throws at you, none's going to happen. Because Jesus is with you. Do we have a song? Let's do this. And if again, if you need prayer, come up. We want to pray with you and for you. All right. Everybody's getting hit. Put our armor right now. Tell Jesus, help me. I've been weak. I've been lazy. I haven't put on my shoes or the breastplate or my belt or my helmet. I don't. I'm not even holding the sword. I'm not even reading the word. Well, right now, the word was for you. The word is for you. Nothing would prevail because Jesus is with us. Right now, yes. <laughs>